Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his sermon number nine, Upon Forgiveness of Injuries, Joseph Butler is going to set out for us some of the problematic aspects of the retaliation that is the natural operation and aim of the feeling, passion, emotion, however you want to define it, of anger, which sometimes he calls resentment. He goes back and forth between the two of these. And he tells us, listen, anger is a passion or a desire, an affectation, which has been implanted in human nature by God. He tells us that in sermon number eight, and he reiterates that in sermon number nine. So that would lead some people to say, oh, well, then it's perfectly fine to respond and to indulge yourself in anger. And Butler wants to caution us against that. Now, as we saw in sermon number eight, anger does in fact have some legitimate ends, whether it's the hasty or sudden anger or the settled or deliberate anger of self-defense, protecting ourselves, also protecting other people, and then preventing or punishing injury, thereby not just helping ourselves and those close to us, but society in general. So people get angry at other people doing what they're not supposed to do. Injury for Joseph Butler means more than just simply harming somebody. There's a sense of wrongdoing involved. And anger, as he's going to point out, we should remind ourselves of this, aims at imposing something bad on the person who is its target or object. So you get angry at somebody by retaliating. You're not doing something good to them. You may say, oh, it's for their good or it's for the good of society. But really the, the actual means is to do something bad. You yell at them, you punch them in the nose, you take away a privilege and ground them, you do whatever it is. If they view it as a good thing, then it's a pretty unsuccessful act of retaliation. Now, Butler says that um, we can have wrong-headed ideas about how this ought to work. He talks about custom and false honor, which are on the side of retaliation and revenge when the resentment is natural and just. But, you know, that tends to go a little bit too far. And he says that uh, I'm not going to examine what's alleged in favor of it from the tyranny of custom and false honor, but only to consider the nature and reason of the thing itself. So we're going to put aside culture and societal expectations and having grown up in a family of shouters or whatever it's going to be where you got wrong-headed ideas about retaliation and anger. We're just going to look at it in, in a more uh, broad cross-cultural and what he's calling natural sense. So one of the first problems that he signals with retaliation and anger is a tendency to produce more anger as a result. And I think that this is completely dead on. Sometimes you see people who are talking about anger in philosophy, like Aristotle, for example, saying that we don't get angry at those who are angry at us because, you know, we assume that what they're, they're doing is the right thing. And, you know, that does not track our human experience at all. Whereas Butler, I think, really does. He says, um, malice or resentment towards any person has a tendency to beget the same passion in him who is the 
object of it. So person A does something to person B. Person B now gets angry at person A, retaliates out of that. Now person A is also angry at person B for having gotten angry at them in the first place. So now we've got more anger that has been created. We have a kind of surplus, right? It has replicated itself within the relationship. And he says, this again increases in the other. It is of the very nature of this vice to propagate itself, not only by way of example, which it does in common with other vices. So, you know, we see other people getting angry or like, oh, I should be angry in those situations too. He says, uh, but in a, in a peculiar way of its own, for resentment itself, as well as what is done in consequence of it, is the object of resentment. So, you know, you raise your voice to me. I don't like that. I get angry. I raise my voice to you. You get angry at me. You say, why are you raising your voice at me? And we're off to the races, so to speak, right? So I think he's quite right about this. He also says that there's another way in which once we get into this dynamic, there is a tendency to produce yet more anger. And he says that, um, you know, the first offense, even when so slight is presently to be dropped and forgotten, becomes the occasion of entering into this whole dynamic uh, in the process of this strife and variance. Um, people change parts. He who was at first the injured person becomes the more injurious and blamable than the aggressor. Now, why is that the case? He talks about the numberless partialities which we all have for ourselves. And this leads to us thinking ourselves injured when we're not or that the injury is greater than it really is. And he says, if bare retaliation or returning just the mischief received always begin, begets resentment in the person upon whom we retaliate, what would that excess do? Add to this that he, the other person, likewise has their partialities. And so each of us has a tendency to respond with more anger than the anger that has been shown to us. So there's this tendency, as he says, to magnify offenses. And this leads to, there's a beautiful phrase, a long intercourse of ill offices, doing bad things to each other. And it can go on and on and on. He says, there's no representing this scene of rage and madness. It is manifest there would be no bounds nor any and since the indulgence of revenge does have this tendency and does actually produce these effects in proportion as it, as it allowed, then, you know, we shouldn't indulge it, right? So that, that's one big problem, this tendency to provoke more anger. He also um, says that anger and retaliation should only be used to produce a greater good. Um, it was, as he says, placed in human beings on supposition of and as a prevention or remedy to irregularity and disorder. So we don't want that passion itself producing irregularity and disorder. And he says, you know, if we consider humankind, according to that fine illusion of St. Paul, as one body and everyone members of one another, then resentment is, with respect to society, a painful remedy. And he says, this is not founded on an illusion or simile. It's drawn from the very nature of the passion itself. And he actually has a great example a little bit later on about, well, what do we do with criminals, right? What if we... What if we execute somebody? And remember, executions were much more common back then than they are uh, in, in, in our present day, at least in the developed countries. And he says that, you know, if, if we're considering executing a criminal, you know, we're actually doing something bad to them. And that's very clear. Why would we do it? Well, uh, the person's life is inconsistent with the quiet and happiness of the world. That is a general and more enlarged obligation, destroys a particular and more confined one. So, you know, we should treat criminals well unless they just can't be uh, part of society. So that's, that should place some restrictions on retaliation as well. And then finally, he's got this third interesting argument about passions 
and ends. And he says, listen, we've got all these different passions and desires and affects. They're part of our human nature. And what are they actually for? What is their purpose? What do they do? Well, each of them has a particular end a purpose, a function, you could say. So think about sexual desire, right? What is its purpose? I mean, Butler, I think, would be fine for saying the propagation of the species. Can you do other things with sexual desire, like uh, turn it in ways that produce all sorts of pleasure? Absolutely. Can it be used to foster intimacy? Indeed, it can. It could be used for all sorts of things. You could also use it to, say, make money, right? You're interested in having sex, so you prostitute yourself. Now, the question that Butler is concerned with is not simply what's the main purpose? What is the, the you know, fundamental primary purpose? And what else can you do with it? It's whether the other thing that you're doing with it, does it contradict the main purpose? If not, he says, well, it's innocent. So, you know, if sexual pleasure does not get in the way of propagating the species or at least being open to that, hey, perfectly fine, right? Um, if it's definitely getting in the way of it, okay, now you've got a problem. And we can think about this now with respect to anger. Well, what is the, the point of anger? What is its purpose? And, you know, he does talk about, you know, protecting society and self-defense and all of these sorts of things. But, you know, how does anger actually work? He says that there's a difference between this passion and all others. No other principle or passion has for its end the misery of our fellow creatures. Now, does it, is it just oriented at the misery? It's oriented at the misery as retaliation that is viewed as, in this case, a good thing rather than a bad thing, right? He says, malice and revenge mediate or meditates evil itself and to do mischief to be the author of misery is the very thing which gratifies the passion. So anger is different than the other emotions, passions, desires, drives that we have. It comes to aim directly at suffering of the person who has angered us as its proper design, right? Other vices eventually do mischief. This alone aims at it as an end. So that's another reason why we shouldn't be indulging anger, except when it's, you know, serving some sort of legitimate purpose. Anger had better be serving the general benevolence if it contradicts it, as is the case so easily. Well, then we need to um, put, you know, put some, some hold on the retaliation or revenge that we're looking for, motivated by resentment and malice. So these are all issues with retaliation, which is what anger not only aims at, but it's integral to the very emotion itself. And Butler wants to raise these so that we, we uh, you know, it's not that we shouldn't get angry whatsoever, but so that we can be very cognizant about how far retaliation should go and whether in many cases we should even think about retaliation at all. So in many cases, we would want to set it aside.